Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the weekly chart of Chipotle Mexican Grill. This was one of my shorts. I don't have any shorts right now. Priceline was one. Apple was one. Um, I really don't think that if I'm right and I win in my shorts, uh, they'll probably MF Global my stock account. So I think I have five dollars in my Ameritrade account right now. But anyway, this is uh, this is how it ends. It always ends suddenly. You can see here that uh, Chipotle has gone from roughly um, 30 bucks or so to 750. I don't know, uh, 20 fold move, 25 fold move, who knows? Uh, but you know, it's paper, it's unsustainable, and it always crashes. But when's the last time you heard anyone say that Chipotle was a bubble or that the stock market was a bubble in the mainstream media? You don't hear that. Remember with silver though? Remember when silver ran from about, uh, I think it was around $18 or so, and then it ran up to 50 bucks. Everybody was saying, silver's a bubble. Isn't that crazy? Um, one of the most undervalued assets in the world was called a bubble when it only basically tripled. Here's something that's gone up 20 to 25 fold uh, that's a restaurant chain. And uh, there's a whole bunch of others like it. Priceline is another one. So that's how things end they end suddenly now i want to take you over this charles hughes smith article he just really has a great mind and and has a way of breaking things down before i do that i want to cover a couple of stories here here's one this is pretty amazing so the eu is trying to connect their uh false flag hoax and like i said i'm not going to go into the details on it uh, for me, again, the soccer stadium thing where um, they kept playing the game after supposedly all those people were killed. That's ridiculous. That's obviously a hoax. Uh, the nightclub, I don't know how many people were killed. Um, you know, if you're going to use 911 as an analogy, um, how many people were killed there? I have no idea. Um, I'm sure some people were killed, but for me, it was a hoax. Uh, I believe September Clues is correct. I've seen the... Uh, VHS tapes, the original archives that show that uh, it was media uh, fakery for the planes. So, you know, something can be a false flag and a hoax, uh, but I, I was convinced when I saw the soccer stadium thing. So here they are trying to tie this to Bitcoin. This is hilarious. Uh, what's the saying that I had on the Bitcoin channel at first? as a quote from, uh, they, it's attributed to Gandhi. It says, um, talking about uh, you know a new idea or something it says first they mock you then they fight you then you win or something like that uh, they're still fighting they fought Bitcoin all the way they really do not like people being able two things they really don't like that cryptography allows and that is secure communications there's other crackdowns going on in cryptography right now uh, stories hitting the wire but they don't like secure anonymous communications between people around the world, and they certainly do not like secure anonymous payments between people around the world. There's no need for all these governments and banks if we have that, and that's why they're trying to connect Bitcoin to terrorism. So here it is out of the EU. By the way, I've shown you the statistics. The European Union now accounts for about 1% of Bitcoin trading, whereas China is 80 to 85% and the U.S. is around 14% or so. So the EU is irrelevant as far as Bitcoin is concerned. European Union countries plan a crackdown on virtual currencies and anonymous payments made online and via prepaid cards in a bid to tackle terrorism financing after the Paris attacks, a draft document seen by Reuters said. EU interior and justice ministers were, will gather in Brussels on Friday for a crisis meeting called after the Paris carnage of last weekend. They will urge the European Commission, the EU executive arm, to propose measures to, quote, strengthen controls of non-banking payment methods such as electronic anonymous payments and virtual currencies and transfers of gold precious metals by prepaid cards, draft conclusions of the meeting said. Now, you remember when Bitcoin first came out, uh, you wouldn't see things like this because for them to um, crack down like this where make this statement, payments through virtual currencies. See, that's an admission that Bitcoin works and they didn't want to admit it in the beginning 
because obviously if they admit that it works, people are going to use it. Now we're in the last stage of them fighting. Of course, the final stage is, is they're going to give up because they can't win. Um, they're against uh, progress. They're against the future. They're, there's no way that they can win. But they will fight, and they'll fight hard, and they're doing so. So they're trying to connect Bitcoin to terrorism. Hilarious. Um, another story I wanted to cover real quick before I go to the Charles Hughes Smith is what's going on in Puerto Rico. This is, you know, this is an unfolding crisis. Now, they try to couch this in terms of Greece and in terms of um, austerity things and, and, and issues like that, but really it's pretty simple. Uh, I've used the analogy before of not enough people pulling the cart and too many people riding in the cart. Well, Puerto Rico is one big cart. There's nothing there to produce any wealth. Uh, some unbelievable percentage of the population is either on welfare or works for the government. So what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is what's going to happen everywhere else. The first thing that's going to happen is government workers aren't going to get paid. That's how it always works. Uh, they can fight it. They can say what they want. But that's what's going to happen. Here is a B of A summary. In a nutshell, the Commonwealth warns it is facing a liquidity crisis set to run out of cash this month and revenues are coming in lower than expected. Revenues from what? Debt is uh, people paying taxes who are paid by the government. Debt is too high and needs to be restructured. Restructured. How do you restructure an unpayable debt? They, they use these terms uh, like stakeholders instead of debtors and, and structure, restructuring. It's a debt default. That's the bottom line. The economy has been mired in nearly a decade-long recession, and economic factors limit Puerto Rico's ability to raise revenues. Health care and retiree costs, along with other essential government services, are more important than paying debt service. And with a lack of access to the capital markets and little room under the constitutional debt cap, it's unlikely that Puerto Rico will be able to borrow to finance its operations. Well, what's essential government services? Um, I would say essential government services are keeping the power and the water running. That would be, for me, essential government services. Taking money from one group of people and giving it to another group of people who don't work, I do not consider that to be essential government services, but that's what we're talking about. Speaking of running out of cash, Height Securities analyst Daniel Hansen now says the acute liquidity strain may well mean that Padilla can't pay government employees, and you know what that means, social unrest. You see that? I've talked about this many times before. You're going to see riots, and the riots is going to be government workers. They're going to be the first ones to riot because they're going to be the first ones to go unpaid. Look at what Jack Lou has done. Jack Lou is uh, ha has taken the money from federal retirement. That's how he patched his way through this uh, deficit crisis. So uh, that's what I've always warned about. People who are dependent on the government, they are going to get cut. There's no way around it. Quote, Puerto Rico's liquidity strains are serious and will likely cause greater levels of public unrest into year end. Hansen said this week in a note, adding that the island's treasury single account likely has a negative cash balance and will make it nearly impossible to meet all government payroll obligations over the next six weeks. As for whether any of this can be avoided, a Senate Judiciary Committee headed by Iowa Republican Charles Grassley will meet on December 1st to discuss a legislative proposal to assist Padilla. So that means taking money from you and me and giving it to people who don't work in Puerto Rico. That's what that means. How how could it be interpreted either way? So again, crazy. Uh, eventually you run out of other people's money. We know that's how it works. So let's get to the Charles Hughes Smith article. Brilliant article. Uh, as I said with uh, the Chipotle stock chart, the crisis is sudden. It comes out of the blue. Uh, now, this latest uh, drop we have here, this is the weekly, but uh, if we pull up the daily, you can see on the daily, the big move is this daily drop. Now they're telling us, well, it's because the, there was some E. coli found. Well, there's always a reason after the fact, but the bottom line is that the people who knew got out. What was this gap down here? So, 
that's how it works. Uh, the suckers are left holding the bag. That's how it always works. Is this how the next global financial meltdown will unfold? In effect, a currency crisis is simply the abrupt revaluation, abrupt revaluation of, a, of the currency to reflect new realities. I've long maintained that the structural imbalances of debt and risk that have triggered the global financial meltdown of 2008-2009 have effectively been transferred to the foreign exchange markets. This creates a problem for the central banks that have orchestrated the quote-unquote recovery by goosing asset bubbles in stocks, real estate, and bonds. Unlike these markets, the currency FX market is too big for even the Federal Reserve to manipulate for long. The FX market trades roughly the entire Fed balance sheet of $4.5 trillion every day or two. Currencies are in the midst of multi-year revaluations that will destabilize the tottering towers of debt leverage and risk that have propped up global growth since 2009. Though the relative value of currencies is discovered in the global FX market, there are four fundamental factors that influence the value of any currency. Number one, capital flows into and out of the currency and the nation that issues the currency. Two, perceived risk, specifically, will this currency preserve my global purchasing power, i.e. capital, or erode it? the yield or interest rate paid on bonds denominated in this currency, and for the scarcity or overabundance of the currency. If we dig deeper, we find that currencies reflect the income streams and assets of the issuing nation. Consider the currency of an oil exporting nation that has seen both its income from selling oil and the underlying value of its oil in the ground fall by more than 50%. Why shouldn't that nation's currency decline in parallel with the erosion of income and asset valuation? As a nation's income and asset base declines, there is less national income to pay interest on sovereign bonds, less private income to tax, and a reduced asset base for additional borrowing. This is especially true if the nation issue if the nation issued debt and or currency profligately in good times. Recall that debt and currency are one and the same. If someone trades euros for a U.S. Treasury bond, they don't just own a bit of sovereign debt. They own the currency of the nation that issued the bond, in this case, the U.S. dollar. This is equally true of corporate bonds. All debt is denominated in a specific currency. Now, this is really important because we know that companies are now beginning to issue Chinese yuan backed or denominated debt. That's very important because that means that those uh, companies are betting on the fact that they believe that the Chinese currency will be more stable and all these other reasons given up here than the US currency. So that's really important. This is equally true of corporate bonds. All the debt is denominated in a specific currency and owners of the bonds are not just betting that interest rates, interest will be paid and the bond redeemed at maturity, but that the underlying currency will not lose much of its global purchasing power. That's why I said the other day that I thought that buying Chinese bonds will be an unbelievable deal going forward because they pay a decent interest rate now they're denominated in the Chinese currency, which I believe will rise. The interest rates probably will uh, go down on those, which means the bonds will go up. So that, that includes all those factors that he's talking about there. And of course, there's the underlying Chinese economy. One proxy for the absolute destruction of commodity-based income streams and assets is the CRB index. No wonder emerging economies that depend heavily on the export of commodities are cratering along with the currencies they issue. And here's the CRB index. You can see breaking down to 184. Unbelievable. I don't know if you saw the story today that the Baltic Dry, I believe, hit 500. Crazy. Once participants become aware of the risking, rising risk of holding a depreciating currency, the trickle out of a currency quickly becomes a torrent of fleeing capital. Once the perceived risk switches from risk on to risk off, the only way to prop up the currency is to raise interest rates that bonds denominated in that currency yield. 
But raising interest rates has a brutally negative effect on the domestic economy as higher rates choke off domestic lending, which then pushes the economy into recession. It's a no-win double bind, though for doing nothing and letting one's currency implode drains the nation of capital and makes imports unaffordable. That matters when the imports are energy and or food. When those become scarce and unaffordable, social disorder soon follows. And it goes on. So an excellent article. Really, he, he does a really good job of breaking things down. And the point is, is that uh, a currency crisis, just like a stock collapse, it can come out of nowhere. And that's because these things are really based on nothing. There are earnings and there is something behind them, but they're really, they're bubbles. And uh, the reason why people are buying Things like Chipotle stock, and it's gone from 35 to 750 over the course of, say, four years or so, four or five years. The reason people are doing that is because they're betting that there will be a another sucker down the line to buy from them at a higher price uh, what they bought at a lower price. But eventually, the whole thing collapses. Now, silver, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. It couldn't be any more different than these things. You can see silver has already been completely hammered. Uh, like I said before, they said that it was a bubble. Of course, you can see here a run from 8 to 48. That's a six-fold move. Nothing like the moves that are made uh, in, the, in those stocks. Some of them run 20, 30, 40, 50, some 100-fold moves. Priceline, for example. But they never call those bubbles. Now, with silver being down here at 14 and looking like the rolling over of the MACD coinciding with this price, looks like they may be setting up for one final smackdown. So if you do have some dry powder, you want to keep an eye out for a test. If there's going to be a test, I don't know where it's going to go. It could even test 12, but it will probably be, if it happens, Will probably be in an overnight period. It'd be a period where you cannot trade and a period where they get the price right back to where it started from and the whole thing is over before you can even pull the trigger. So if you are planning on pulling the trigger, have your Atmex, your Gainesville, your Provident, your Jam Bullion, have your sites up, refreshing prices, and uh, get ready to lock in that price because if we do get that drop, I don't think it will be down there for long. And we'll talk to you next time.